Welcome to Bear Archery's Hunting 101 podcast, where hunters new and old come to learn and find inspiration from stories of hunts gone by. Everyone is welcome to enjoy the outdoor way of life, and there is no better time to start than right now. So let's head into the great outdoors with your host, Dylan Ray. Welcome to Bear Archery's Hunting 101 podcast, as always, presented by our good friends over at Scentlock. I've got Mr. Aaron Warbritton from The Hunting Public and Chris Chain of Season Report. Gentlemen, how are you? Good. Doing great. This has been an exciting series thus far. This is episode four of our Deer 101 series, and uh, we kind of got this out of this desire and this passion to start this deer series to teach people from the ground up how to deer hunt um and so we're in episode four and we are covering preparation for a deer hunt now um i'm not talking like you know trained to hunt type stuff that's not what we're talking about here we're talking long long term preparation for hunting um and then short term like you're actually getting ready to go on a whitetail hunt the next morning the next weekend what should you be doing um and Aaron's already informed us it's honeydews is what you need to be doing if you're going. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, but that, so that's kind of what we want to cover is all year long. Uh, how do you prepare for whitetails? And then, um, you know, coming up, you got to hunt this weekend to hunt, you know, tomorrow morning. Um, how do you prepare for the hunt at that point? So, um, Aaron, you guys cover, um, well, first off, let me, let me take a step back. If you guys don't know what season report is, Season report is one of the best tools, in my opinion, for the pre- for preparation of a hunt, period. Um, long-term, short-term, whatever. I use season report year-long. Um, Chris, give us a quick rundown because I will refer to season report uh, several times. So give us a quick rundown of what season report is. Yeah, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's the Hunter's Almanac. It takes the whole nation's regulations into one spot, adds in foraging, gardening. And so basically, if you get food with your hands this brings all that information to one easy to use personalized dashboard now i when it comes to preparation for hunt uh we're going to kind of ignore the foraging and the gardening aspect of things and talk about regulations and season date side of things um so aaron when you're preparing year round for a hunt um how do you kind of stay prepared for whitetail season uh well whitetails are kind of unique in the fact that you're always you're always kind of they're always in the back of your mind like uh turkeys for example if it's in the middle of turkey season they're my favorite thing to hunt you know people always ask what's your favorite game to chase or whatever and mine just depends on the month yeah (laughs) um so if it's in the middle of april i'm solely focused on turkeys but once july comes around or, or august I mean, pretty much not thinking about turkeys other than trying to improve some habitat here and there until, until March. Uh, Deer is the opposite of that. Like deer are like a marathon, if you will. So I'm always, I'm always thinking about deer, uh, regardless of what time frame of the year it is. Now, turkeys might take the priority in April, but that doesn't mean that we're still not paying attention to sign that we're finding in the woods while we're out there turkey hunting to in preparation for deer season because you can you can almost always learn something more about the deer herd every single time that you go out on the whatever property it is that you're hunting at all times of the year so that's kind of i guess that's uh that's the best way i can start off my preparation if you will is it it never really stops it's all it's always continuous i mean i never i've hunted some properties for years and years and i still don't know everything that i feel like i should about it there's always something else that i could learn and all that goes into your preparation absolutely now and that's 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 been kind of a reoccurring theme of not only this series but uh, of the past conversations the last three weeks um is that whitetails more than anything else is a year-long chess match like sure if you go on an elk hunt you hop out of the truck and you've got two weeks to kill an elk like that's your job locate and sneak up and kill an elk whitetails is much more of a year-long process 
I mean, it's, you know, we're, we're constantly hanging stands, trimming lanes, uh, food plots, blinds, you name it. Uh, we're constantly working on different things. And even if it's not in the field working, like my mind is constantly consumed with, man, I wonder if I should move that tree stand. I wonder if I, last year, you know, I saw those bucks going this way. I wonder if maybe they're hitting that drainage. And my mind's constantly spinning about whitetails. And so that is the difference, like you said, about whitetail hunting. So I will start by saying the first thing I do, if somebody calls me and says, hey, let's go on a whitetail hunt in uh, Iowa, um, and they call me in July, the first thing I'm going to do is pull out season report. Uh, and that, this isn't a sales pitch. The first thing I'm going to do is pull out season report to check regulations. Why? Because I need to know what dates I can go, what dates um, are going to work for me as far as, as when the season's open, as far as when my schedule will allow it. Um, and so I pull up season report to check the dates that, that the seasons are open, but also regulations. Here's why. I've been bitten the butt a few times because I prepare and get ready and cite my bow in for um, a mechanical broadhead, and then that state doesn't allow mechanicals, so I got to switch to fixed blades. Uh, or, uh, like I fell into the problem in Idaho, I sighted in, I was so ready to go the week before the bow is shooting great. Then I realized you can't have anything lighted on your bow at all. Well, I was shooting a lighted sight. And so, um, I ended up changing sights and, and it was just that, that, so if you check regulations far in advance and you make sure you're preparing for what's legal. Um, and so that's the first thing I do is check regulations. If I know I'm going to be hunting in this state. Um, because I don't want to be preparing for something that I can't do. Um, so Chris leading up to, you've checked regulations, you've checked dates. We've already covered that our minds are always consumed about whitetails. Um, months leading up to the hunt, what are you doing to be prepared? Well, first, I just got to say that, you know, that answer is perfect. It's an, it's an all year, uh, pursuit, but the, the months leading up, I mean, obviously getting dialed in. But that's when I start going back and looking at all those GPS locations that I've saved. And it gets back to that, that year long perspective of if you're always in the woods looking for turkey, uh, you're, get, you're gonna notice the whitetail habitat. You're gonna notice where the oaks are. You're gonna notice all the different food sources out there in the woods and drop those pins so you can come back to it later. And case in point, I was, uh, I was in the springtime looking for berries in a particular spot in the Virginia mountains. And I stumbled upon this perfect saddle, uh, this perfect little pass between two, this ridge line. And I dropped a pin there and I'm, that's going to be the first place I go back to because, you know, I, I wouldn't have found it any other, for any other reason, uh, for not being out there on my feet, but it had the perfect habitat, water on both sides, deer coming through. And so I think at this point, months leading up, I'm really just thinking about all the different opportunities I have and trying to whittle it down to, to my top five. Absolutely. So we, we covered scouting and we covered where to hunt. Um, and for preparation of these hunts, what I'm literally doing is there's been times I've cleared off my desk. I, I take my computer off my desk. I, I print out different maps of each property that I'm going to be hunting. Um, I'll mark on their tree stands uh, on the, and I want physical maps that I can actually look at and f flip between and look at this one next to this one. And I'll mark each tree stand on each property. This is better for a North wind. This is better for a South wind. This is better for a, and then I can look at, so say I've got three properties, two tree stands on each. That's that's six tree stands. I can literally map out, you know, okay, if I've got a South wind, I need to be here. If I've got a North wind, I need to be here. And then in the weeks leading up, I can actually start looking at, you know, 10 day, 15, 20 day forecast and planning out, okay, on the 12th, I've got a bad wind for here. So I need to be over here on the 15th. I've got a bad wind for here. I need to be here. Um, so I'll actually start planning out those weeks, the, the weeks leading up to season. Um, and then all throughout season, I, I plan that all, all that stuff out in ahead. Now, of course, weather changes, um, and, and things come. And so, um, that's when we'll talk about next day preparation because just because I decided a week ago on the 15th, I'm going to be in this stand. If the wind switches the night before and it's showing me a different wind, I've got to make a new game plan. So we'll get to that. We'll get to that season or that, that hunt prep uh, day, day of and day before here in just a second. Um, Aaron, you're big on arrows. You're big on broadheads. You're big on making sure your equipment is going to blast through anything you shoot at. 
Um, with that, what are you doing equipment wise to stay prepared for whitetails? Um, sharpening broadheads would probably be the first thing. Uh, shoot, I, I guess shooting broadheads would probably be the first thing, but beyond that, yep, there you go, Dylan. Um, I, like I have my bow sitting right here on the floor next to me and about every hour or two, I jet out and shoot an arrow. Um, in fact, that's kind of how most of us work because we we're constantly working from home on computers. Yeah. We will just, we're, we'll edit for a couple hours and then we'll go out in the yard and we'll shoot like one, two, three times. But I haven't shot a field point in a month. They're yeah. all broadheads. Bingo. And, and I'm not going to use these same broadheads to hunt with, but they are the same exact brand or style that I'm going to hunt with. Out, outside of practicing with broadheads, we're also trying to, we're also trying to practice realistic hunting situations if possible. So like getting in a saddle, getting in a stand in the yard, shooting from your knees, shooting from awkward positions, maybe running and then getting your heart rate up and trying to shoot that way, shooting at dark, shooting at daylight, um, in low light conditions, shooting at targets in the wide open, shooting at targets through the woods where you have other things in between you and the target, shooting without a range finder so that you can identify how far away you believe that target is just based on, you know, your perception alone. All of these things are just throwing different variables in because as you know, every single hunting situation is different in some way, shape or form. And you've got to sort of train your mind to be able to adapt to those. So I think that's all real good preparation in summer and the sharpening is a big deal. I can, in the broadheads I'm shooting now, it takes me about 45 minutes to really sharpen one well. So sharpening and conditioning those, and then throughout the fall, we'll touch them up, but we get them set and ready to go right now. All right. Give me your number one broadhead sharpening tip. Uh, every one of them is a little bit different. So it's almost uh, yeah, bro sharpening broadheads is almost like an art. You kind of got to pick a couple of them that you like and start to practice with different jigs, different diamond plates and sandpapers and whatnot until you find out what works. It's, it's no different than sharpening a knife. You know, you're going to yeah. find a system that works well for you over time, and then you can start to hone that and get better and better. But as a, as a general rule of thumb, I take a broadhead and I start off with like high grit, diamond plate or high grit sandpaper like i've got 200 grit diamond plate and i'll run it over that until i get a burr on it then i'll pull the burr off with 400 grain i'll do the same thing until i get a burr with 400 and then i go to 800 and then i go to 1200 and then i go to 2000 and then i go to a leather strop or a piece of cereal box cardboard with some buffy that with sandpaper too you can do that with double bevel broadheads with single bevels three blades whatever um, but that's just, that's the progression of, of honing that edge over time until it is as absolutely sharp as you can get it. Did you, and that's see, what we try to do right now. Yeah. Did you see the new broadhead from bear at ATA? Yep. Yep. Have you shot it yet? I have a little bit. Flies good. I'm excited got, for it. I mean, yeah, man. I think it'll do well. Um, I think it'll do, are you shooting single bevel or double bevel? Single bevels right now. Always. But I mean, I'm kind of, I kind of float, man. I, I switched from mechanicals a few years ago and I got, you know, people are like, oh, you know, you're on the, you're on the cut on contact train or whatever. I'm not really on any sort of, you know, belong to any side of whatever the broadhead debate is. I'm just, I just like to experiment with things and see what we come up with based on our real world, real world experiences. And then I can draw conclusions from there because I use mechanicals for a long, long time. And I've only used single bevels now for like three years. So the amount of information that I have on them is still pretty small. Okay. So I'm trying to sort of build more catalog with that. I don't want to get off topic here, but I'm going to for a second. Sure. We have lost, <laughs> yeah. hunters have lost the the enjoyment of tinkering. And what I mean, like, yeah, we just think like, oh, they say this is the best broadhead. That's what I have to be shooting. I absolutely love tinkering with my equipment. Love it. Yeah, like, and you'll learn a lot doing things. that. 
Yeah. I used to do that same thing, Dylan. I would just pick up, I would go to the archery shop and I would buy whatever flew best according to them. And I would just shoot that through the fall and killed a lot of deer doing that. And if you don't have the time or, or the ambitions, you know, whatever to do all that tinkering, by all means do it. But once I started tinkering with arrows, building my own, sharp, learning to sharpen broadheads, I just started getting a better understanding of how the entire system works. So, and, and in that process, I'm, I, I started shooting a lot more by default because I had, you know, another thing that kept me interested was just trying all these different things. And I realized like my shooting started to improve yeah. because I was just shooting more in Absolutely. general. So I, I think tinkering is a very good thing to do just to experiment for yourself. So I've talked to Zach a bit about this. But when are you gonna when are you gonna dive into the to the traditional world? I uh, I have a little bit already. I turkey hunted for him a few years ago with a stick, and man, that was fun but frustrating at the same time. Yeah. Uh, I it was I practiced with it for four or five months and then hunted all spring with it, and it was a blast. But I don't know. I don't I I don't want to do it until I know that I have the time to devote to it. Right, because as you as you know, it takes a long time, and it's that constant repetition that will will give you confidence and make you good, good enough to harvest an animal. Yeah, and I never I never felt like I was quite confident enough to take it to the woods to, to shoot a deer with. De that's just based on the amount of time. Yeah, I feel like no. if I had three four months in advance, I could maybe try it, and we might one of these years. The reason I ask is because that really truly has given me back like the joy of tinkering, like the, yeah. the, the going down and playing with the bow and just figuring out different stuff. And, and, and it, it, I'll tell you what's crazy is you talked about the time and the preparation and I'm getting ready for an elk hunt and I had fully, I've shot recurve for two years now. And, you know, in those two years, I've probably shot 10 arrows out of my compound. And I honestly, I tried to tell myself, I'm like, I better get the compound out and start practicing for this elk hunt. And, uh, and I can honestly say, I feel like I was shooting it. I'm like, dude, I got to take the recurve because I feel way more confident with the recurve than I do this. And, you know, I understand. I'm like, man, it's going to suck if an elk's at 60, but I would, I would much rather be confident at 40 with my recurve than unconfident with my compound at 60. So, um, that's, what's going to happen. There you go. That's awesome. Chris, what is uh, leading up to deer season? Um, equipment wise, what do you focus on and staying prepared with? Uh, you know, I just joined the saddle uh, hunting, I guess. Oh, no. Can, 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 can you call that like a contagion? Uh, yeah, I just, <laughs> hopped on that. I just hopped on that train. So I don't know if I'm quite confident enough to, uh, you know, I, I, cli I climbed up in a tree. I sent some arrows down range and I feel good with that part. I don't know if I'm quite confident enough to do it in the field yet, but uh, definitely testing that, going checking stands and stuff like that. And kind of getting back to a, an earlier question of ways to train. I was just visiting family and uh, down in Tennessee and they have a nice porch that is on a second floor, looking down at a perfect spot to practice easily some, some top down shots. And there's this big tree right in the middle of their backyard and it leaves a perfect opportunity to go and put a uh, target through these different holes I mean, they're not tiny holes but they're the kind of scenarios you're going to encounter in the woods and so just moving that target around to those different opportunities from 20 to 30 to 40 going through actual limbs like you're going to have to try to do in the real world uh, that has been a, a primary focus of what i'm doing but then you know, to answer your question getting back to gear Making sure everything's working well, putting weight on it, uh, that nothing's deteriorated, batteries are changed in the rangefinder, stuff like that. Now, yeah, I'd I'd say noise is something I'm focused on too. That's that brings up a good point, Chris. Like the the noise aspect of your gear, especially when you're deer hunting, is something that I did not used to think about a lot. But now we use moleskin, stealth strips, all that stuff. I mean, for our saddle platforms, for our stands, for buckles, you know, for anything that you're going to have metal on metal contact. I mean, you know that like the Trophy Ridge uh, Sync MD rest, the drop aways come with those little strips 
of felt that you can put on them to keep your arrows quiet. And I've got like seven or eight extras of those. So every time one of them starts wearing where I can start to hear my arrows sliding back over the rest, I want to change it. So just a little segue there. That's one other thing that we're messing with a lot. We've got stealth strips laying all over the house. No, on, my, on uh, noise. Go uh, ahead. So on noise, I, I understand exactly what you're saying. I have this uh, ghillie suit that I love during bow season. It lets me just, you know, get the good camouflage on, but wear a t-shirt underneath. And this particular one that I bought, um, it came with all these zippers and it, it was yeah. great. But I just, I found that in my practice leading up, I could hear myself way too much. And so I had busted out two sets of pliers, ripped off every single zipper. And now, I mean, it's perfect. I never use those holes, really. I'm always using the pack. But uh, I hear what you're saying, just making sure you're stealthy and thinking, what on me could a deer hear? Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I worked at a bow shop through college. That's how I worked my way through college. And... I absolutely hated when people would come in three days before season started and be like, dude, my bow just blew up. I need you to get a new string on it today. And I'm like, well, we can't. We got to order strings. We got to, you know, whatever. Um, the reason it made me so mad, not because you were so unlucky as to have a bow blow up, but why weren't you practicing all year long? You pulled out of the closet three days before season. You take 10 shots and your bow blows up. Had you been practicing – now, listen, I understand, like, it can still happen three days before season even if you shoot all the, all year long. But if you're shooting all year long, you're going to catch those maintenance issues in July, and then you have plenty of time to get it fixed. You're going to catch those issues right. earlier in the year because, A, it's not sitting in the closet with the strings rotting off of it. You're keeping them lubricated. You're keeping everything going because you're shooting. And so your bow stays in better performance. Uh stays in better shape to perform and then you're going to catch maintenance issues earlier in the year if it does happen um so absolutely be shooting your bow absolutely be practicing in hunting scenarios i look like an absolute goof uh at my house because i built a shooting platform off my back deck so i can shoot at 12 at 12 feet high um, and i've got all these 3d targets in my backyard and and people can see since I'm high, they can see over my privacy fence, like, what is that idiot doing? And I'm just up there shooting my bow and, and uh, having a blast. But you've got to practice how you're going to shoot. If you're going to hunt out of a ground blind, shoot out of ground blinds. If you're going to be spot and stalking, it sounds incredibly funny. But I've literally crawled through the ground and then get up on my knees and shoot. Because I want to practice exactly how, as close to exactly how I'm going to hunt as I can. Um, so shooting from tree stand shooting from your knees shooting from ground blinds practice in those situations and not just three days before season comes but try to stay prepared all year long um now i also i know in preparation i get i get it all the time like well yeah dylan you get to shoot an hour a day but not everybody gets to do that i i know i get that but aaron what aaron said is one arrow at a time that takes literally 45 seconds to walk out your back door, sling an arrow and get back to work. Literally 45 seconds. Um, it doesn't have to be an hour a day dedicated to shooting. It doesn't even have to be an hour a week dedicated to shooting, but all throughout the year, if you get those times in to get a shot in, you're going to stay more prepared and things won't happen three days before season. Um, so leading up to the hunt, um, like day of day before, week of what's kind of your preparation uh process as far as getting your clothing getting your pack getting your your bow all that good stuff what's kind of your preparation look like leading up to the weekend of a hunt or the day of a hunt um what's that look like for you either one of you you can go uh, first I'll Chris. Take, all right i'll take this yeah uh obviously everything's cleaned uh to make sure it doesn't smell but i like to leave after everything's working well, I like to leave everything, uh, assuming there's no rain or, or cold front coming through, that's really going to stress a, a huge temperature change. I like to leave everything outside, kind of buried in some leaves, just to get as much natural scent as possible and remove that that uh, human living condition scent off of everything. Sometimes that's in the back of the truck. Sometimes it's on the ground. I don't go quite so far as having like the ozone uh, duffel bag 
that I know some people use, but I just really try to get all of my gear kind of uh, all of my clean gear as dirty as possible for, for that next day. I would say from a, well, from a gear standpoint, I'm, I'm kind of a minimalist. I like to just have my bare bones, basic stuff with me. So like you mentioned a while ago, Chris, I've, uh, you're diving in the saddle world. I've got one and I want my saddle platform, my sticks, my uh, saddle itself. I want to make sure all my ropes, my buckles and all of that are working properly and are there, which I would have done, you know, prior to during the summer. But I want to make sure that it's packed tightly and quietly. Like I have my packing system down. So, you know, my platform goes on the inside, my water bottle goes on the outside, my sticks go on the outside of that, and then are are cinched down on the back of the pack so that it's super quiet while I'm packing it into the woods. And if I need a rope, do I need a knife? Where do I put my tags to keep them dry so that if I'm in any sort of weather that they can't get wet? I'm kind of, I'm spending a lot of time on the pack itself, um, just making sure that I have all of the, the nuts and bolts that I need in, in the right spots so that I can access them easily. And the other thing, like you all have mentioned weather several times, that's something I'm looking at in a very detailed manner for like the three or four days leading up to the, uh, the hunt. I want to know what the wind speed is going to be, how much moisture is going to be on the ground. Is it going to be rainy? Is it going to be windy? Is it going to be cold? Is it going to be hot? Because any one of those factors can change how I enter and exit a particular area or how I, you know, go about hunting a particular spot. Obviously, the wind is important, but I'm even looking at the wind speed and the moisture that's on the ground. If it's dead calm and crunchy out, I may not be able to go in as far in the morning as I'd like because I'm making too much noise. On the flip side, if it's wet and windy first thing in the morning, I may be able to go into a much more sensitive area and obviously we have those broken down across the map you know so all those all those small conditions make up a, a lot of the decisions on where we're going to hunt right up into just a few hours before we go and on top of that you're also looking at food sources as you guys know in the fall we're hunting deer that are constantly moving as as far as like their usage on the landscape goes so they may be using one tiny pocket of the land for the first week of the season and the next week they may be using a different area depending on what's available to them with food you know if if i've been scouting an area and i'm looking at a bunch of oak trees for example at the end of september say it's the 28th and my season opens on october 1 i'm looking at the acorns in those oak trees if I see a bunch of them up there and notice that they're starting to fall right before season comes in, then you've got you've got a good situation. You know, you you put you're potentially you're anticipating where those deer are going to move to. And those food sources, they can change just like that. I mean, maple leaves, whenever they dry out and start to fall in the creek bottoms, deer will go through there and suck them up immediately like a vacuum cleaner. That may be a hot food source for three days, but you're gonna miss that if you're not. If you're not pouring that into your preparation in the few days that are leading up to your hunt, that stuff doesn't matter as much in the middle of the summer or last spring, but that's really right. important info that you got to have right like day of almost. Right. And that's why um, in both episodes, well, all three episodes, we've talked about um, not hunting memories of a property. And that's the biggest thing because mm -hmm. – you know, you might remember, dude, the first week of October, this place was popping. Well, that's because the acorns were falling first week of October last year. They might fall third week of October this year. And you've got to you've got to not hunt memories of a property, but stay prepared um, weekly on what your properties look like, what they're doing, how they're changing. The three biggest things I look at. I pull out season report again um, just to make sure rifle season is not coming up. I don't have to wear orange. Um, you know, I, I check, make sure there's no, like one property I have butts right up against the river. So I'm constantly checking is duck season open because if it is, they're going to be blasting ducks all day long. So I'm making sure no seasons are overlapping and I've got to be aware of anything special. Um, 
I'm checking the weather constantly. Um, I've got like nine weather apps and, and I look at each one of them because each one of them gives me something different. Like one of them might not give me um, humidity. One of them might not give me as accurate of barometric pressure. And so I look at each one um, to try to decide where am I hunting? Um, am I hunting? Uh, yeah, I, I don't. I don't just hunt because I have the opportunity. If things look like crap, I don't, I don't go out. I mean, if it's like, dude, I'm not going to see any deer. It's a horrible day to go. I'm not going to force myself to go just to, just to booger up deer because of bad, bad wind and stuff. So I look at the weather. Um, and then I start with gear. I start looking at first thing I look at is clothing. Um, I, listen, I was huge. I was not huge on Merino wool, uh, for whitetail hunting. And that's one thing that has changed my life uh, when it comes to whitetail hunting. I got um, a bunch of minus 33 on sale at like backcountry.com one time, and it changed my life because scent is not as big of an issue now. Um, it's easier to care for, um, and it really, it, it really does do what it needs to do in the stand. So I look at all my clothing. Um, what kind of base layers do I need? I'm always wearing bases, even if it's 95 degrees outside because I want that Merino next to skin. Um, so I'm always looking at clothing, um, washing clothes, prepping clothes, making sure, you know, if it is a week long hunt, how does the weather change in that week? Making sure I've got clothes for each, you know, weather change or wind and, and, you name it. So, um, those are kind of the three things that I make sure and look at. And I had one guy, I was telling one guy this, he said, you haven't even mentioned your bow. And I, I just told him like, yeah, because I just told you my bow, I, I prepare that all year long. Like those things are ready. Like I don't, I don't have to the night before do anything with my bow the week before I don't have to do anything with my bow because like Aaron has said, I've already been shooting my broadheads for two months i've already you know shot those broadheads a thousand times i'm ready to go with the bow so now all i'm looking at is what am i putting on my body because i've got my weapon i've made sure the seasons are open and i'm legal and and all that good stuff now all i gotta do is get my clothes ready roll out and go hunting so that's kind of what i look at um leading so you up don't to get the, ready for a, the a marathon the day before you yeah. uh just right. get your bow yeah right no, you're absolutely correct. Uh, before we move on, um, I do have to give a shout out to my guys over at minus 33. Um, I am a huge fan of Merino wool and I've worn a whole bunch of it and minus 33 just seems to do it really, really well. Um, and for affordable. So I've got totes full of minus 33 and that is essentially what I wear, um, under my scent lock. So that is, I live and die by minus 33. I haven't worn any other socks or underwear in like six years. Um, Aaron, I don't mean this bad. <laughs> you guys don't care about scent, do you? Nope. Oh, no, that's not. I guess that's not totally true. We do care tremendously about scent and we ground care scent. about the wind. And mm -hmm. yeah, you guys we don't. We you don't, guys haven't uh, washed yourself in like. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, there's sometimes when I wear pants, same pair of pants for a month straight. Um, yeah. It, uh, yeah, I, I still, we still occasionally will put them in totes and stuff like that to keep them separate. Um, but mostly, I'm more concerned about where I'm walking and where the wind is taking my scent. And that doesn't just have to do with the wind direction. That's like thermals and, you know, wind swirl, uh, how the, you know, how each and every spot sets up. Cause you'll see, I mean, you guys know, like if you go out there and it's, it says a West wind for a particular spot that you're going to hunt and you get in there and it's kind of like on a bowl or the side of a ridge, or you've got right. a weird situation with topography or habitat, the wind may or may not be coming out of the West right there. Uh, it just behaves differently. It flows like water through the environment. So I'm always, I'm always like hyper focused on that when I go into an area, and I try to remember that. I should probably take better notes because we hunt so many different areas. But you know, there's there's a lot of spots that guys will say that are almost impossible to hunt because of bad wind, because of swirling winds or whatever. But what in my experience, most of them there is 
some sort of condition where you can get in there and hunt it. But you just have to you just have to kind of keep chipping away at it until you find out what that is. Like uh, you know, if you're if you're hunting in a low spot, a low bottom, for example, where any sort of wind creates terrible swirling and you have issues with deer getting you, you might think about going in there really early on a high pressure cold morning and see what your scent does at 20 feet. See what it does at 30 feet in the tree because it could be different from 15 to 30 feet. You know, I've I've been in those situations before where we were 25, 30 feet in a tree and the scent just literally hung at stand height for the first hour and a half. And then as soon as the day winds picked up, they started to swirl down and through that bowl and you could forget about it. But for the first hour and a half, you could uh, smell like a chimney sweep up there if you wanted to, and they're not going to get you because the wind isn't getting to them. Um, it just, it totally depends on the, the situation. So I guess that's a long winded way of answering your question, See, Dylan. It's like, I'm the opposite. pay attention to the scent, but I'm the opposite. I go, if I've got that place where I just can't hunt, I go ground blind with the dropping pressure uh, because then sure, my, that it, works too. It's just pushing that yep. scent down into my ground blind and I can work to contain yep. it. I mean, um, sure. It's going to come out. I'm, I'm not saying that I'm not saying there's a magic pill, but um, I can really oh, you push can that certainly contain down. it though. And, and blinds. I mean, we used to do that on winkies when I worked for him, we would get in rednecks with the dead opposite, terrible wind and basically seal that thing up as tight as you could. It yeah. would get pretty stuffy in there after a couple of hours, but, um, you know, it would keep your scent from going downwind. You could get yeah. it tight enough to where it would cut down on that. I've even noticed that hunting on the ground sometimes in low spots where you just get in a ditch. Uh, you know, you just drop down in a ditch that's six foot deep, and occasionally your wind will, if you stay low enough in that ditch, will not leave it. It will just settle into the bottom of the ditch as sort of the day wind is blowing over top of your head 10 feet above that. Okay, I think I know your answer. That's why I'm asking. You, you mentioned first hour of the day, you could see that your scent just hung there. How are you telling that? Milkweed. Yes. Yes. Yep. That's, that's, that's the big deal for us. Um, I use, I don't know, a pot of it a week or more. And, and I even use it some in the off season just depending on what the what the cover looks like in the woods you know because it can all be it can all change obviously in november december if all the leaves are off the wind is going to behave a little bit different in that environment than it will in june but if an early part of turkey season you're hunting one of those areas and you got a little milkweed on you and you notice the wind is coming out of the north you might drop a little bit just to experiment and see how it's flowing through that you know that creek bottom or that canyon that you're in any little bit, any little tidbit of information that you can get like that and jot down in your notes, you could potentially help you over time. But milkweed always, man, it shows you some cool stuff. Like I was sitting next to a pond once that was warming because the, it had direct sunlight. It was like 70 degrees is a high. Yeah. And that, that temperature was different right above the water just slightly than it was, you know, 30 yards away and 30 feet up in a tree where I was at. And as it, uh, you know, as the evening went on, you could, con you could see the milkweed change. Sometimes it would, it would, you know, as the evening wore on, it would actually suck over to that pond. It was almost like that that pond was holding, you know, w almost the water cooled off faster. So it, then, then the air temperature as it was going, or maybe I've got that opposite, but either way I was dropping the milkweed and it was going straight to that pond and the day winds had been blowing the opposite direction all day. Or even if you hunt next to a river, if it's like a spring-fed creek with real cool water or something in it, you can drop that milkweed and you'll see that river almost pull that scent right down through the water. I mean, not into the water, but it'll pull it down into the, yeah. you know, into the river channel and follow that down just like the water will. Depending on the wind speed. I mean, if it gets up too high, the wind's going to take it wherever it's going to take it, right? But it, all of those things can change the direction and how it, how your scent behaves, I guess, in the environment. Right. Now, now, are next... you talking about something other than a, a talc bottle? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, because you can't can you... see that with the talc talc bottle. Can you can you back up? I completely have never heard of milkweed as a visual aid. I mean, is this coming in a bottle? 
or no, you just pick it. It grows uh, oh, the ground. It grows in the road ditches. You just pick it and uh, and it's like I don't know. Have you ever seen like cattail seeds? Yeah. How they just kind of float through the air. Even cotton. Cotton is super light and it kind of floats through the air. Milkweed is is just like that, except it's even lighter. Like if you take the right amount of milkweed in a situation where there's no wind, you can almost drop it at eye level and it will sit there and float in the air. And the advantage of, yeah, there you go. Yeah, the wind wow. floaties, those were good. Yeah, there's our wind indicator right there. Yeah. But honestly, that's what I've used a lot of the time are just those pods, just the natural pods themselves. I yeah. that will that show you what. There you go. Yeah, you that shows you like what that. the wind is doing. Yeah, it doesn't show you what the wind is doing just right there. It shows you what it's doing 30, 40, 50 yards away from you. Cut, so, cut is, the you seeds. know, a lot of us, yeah, yeah, you just pluck the seeds off and then you toss the the feathery stuff. But a lot of times, you know, a lot of people have been busted in the stand, including me, where the wind was hitting you right in the face and you had a big one come in or something and you just took off or a deer did, period. And you're like, what the heck? The wind is coming from the deer to me. Well, that milkweed a lot of times will clear that up because you can drop it and you can see it go back behind you. But then something that you didn't, that you didn't think of is actually pulling that scent back down at nose level to that deer. And it's, it smelled you. If you can't find it, Chris, which sometimes it is, um, like here in Kansas, it can be hard to find because farmers do a really good job of crushing it. Um, but you can buy it for dirt cheap. Um, but here's like some really cool ideas, like draw, drill a little bitty hole in the pill bottle and you can just pull out a little clip of it. Um, yeah. uh, those old coin purses that you split apart and there's a slit in the yeah. middle, uh, you can pull it off like kind of a tissue cool. bottle type type thing and, and get little pieces of it. Um, or like the mesh bags, uh, which is what the hunting public has, um, like the mesh bags, um, and just pull out a little piece of it and, and drop it. But yeah, that's, uh, uh, next episode, we're talking about necessary gear to go whitetail hunting um, with the, the boys from Scentlock, and they're huge on milkweed. And uh, and so I know that's what one of their necessary pieces of gear will be. Um, super, super beneficial. I go to my – I just drive over to the dam uh, in our town, and I can pick as much as I could ever dream of having. Um, that's about the only place I've ever found it because nobody's farming it or, or – um, but – it's also really good for monarch bur butterflies. Um, so, like, it, you could plant it in your backyard. Um, I've seen people do that, just plant a little a plot of it in their backyard so they always have some. Uh, and then it's also really good for butterflies around their house. So, um, man, we got way off topic with milkweed, but um, Aaron's passionate <laughs> yeah. about it. No, nah, it's super cool. Oh, yeah. Love using it. It's a very cool tool to use. Uh, the reason I asked if you guys care about scent um, I was a whitetail hunter through and through my entire life. And, and I was the dude that showered before every sit, um, and washed my clothes three times a day, like sprayed my boots and, and ozone bags and ozone closets. And which I do, I use ozone. I've got an ozone closet. Um, uh, but I remember the first Western hunt I went on, I'm like, wait a minute, I haven't showered in three weeks. Like, how's this going to happen? Um, and I remember just like thinking you got to hunt the wind and hunt thermals and, and learning that. Mm -hmm. And then I came back, um, that was probably 2016. Um, I came back and ever since then, I still care about scent because I am a whitetail guy. I still wash, I still prep my clothes. Uh, but you know, I'm not, I'm not that anal about it anymore. You know, I used to be the kind of guy that like wouldn't touch his food like i would i'd like open the food and like eat it off the without touching it you know because <laughs> i didn't want to get sent on my yeah head. um yeah and now i just you know I, i'll put lotion on and stuff like who cares um and then just hunt the wind and hunt the thermals and milkweed plays a huge role in that so chris what is your biggest when it comes to hunt prep what's your biggest tip your hunting 101 pro tip for hunt prep uh, I think it's not about hunting. It's about getting everything settled, all the honeydew lists out of the way. So where when I'm in the field, I'm not I'm not chewing on something that I'm neglecting back home. Uh, I you know we've all been there where you kind of let something slide so you can go hunting, and uh, 
I find if I, you know, it's kind of the, the age old saying of, you know, uh, discipline equals freedom, right? So if I'm disciplined and get everything that I'm supposed to do out of the way, uh, I can be free to just get out in the woods a lot longer. Which is why Aaron's changing the windows in his garage today. <laughs> yep. That's exactly right. And that's a great, that is a great tip. Like, you not only can be in the woods longer if you do that, but you're going to be more focused on what you're doing. Right. If you got a, if you got 10 other irons in the fire and you're out there trying, trying to hunt and have fun, it just doesn't work well because then you, then you, your mind isn't where it needs to be. So your hunt, if you, if you get all of your stuff done, like you're saying, Chris, before you go, then you can solely focus on the hunt and you can pour all your brain power into it on that particular day, which will increase your odds of success. What's your, what's your hunting 101 preparation tip? Sharpen your broadheads? <laughs> no, I, it's probably just go back and reiterate what I talked about earlier with the, with the conditions and the food sources um, yeah. when it comes to whitetails. Like, uh, pay attention to what is going on that day and the day before. It is, like, if I don't have a good grasp of it, I would almost rather skip a hunt and spend it scouting than I would actually hunting. Um, like if I don't yeah. have a lot of confidence in, in, in what is going on there, I would rather just cover more ground or I'd rather go to a different place and, and see what, you know, if I can find fresh deer sign there, or try to understand if I, if I feel like I got a good understanding of what the deer are doing that day or in that short time frame, then my confidence is going to go way up. I'm going to sit longer. I'm going to be more focused and ultimately have more success. That's good. No, I, I, I've told people like, it's really hard to fathom the idea of burning a hunting day to scout. That's hard, yeah. especially for the weekend warriors, especially for the guys who, you know, are hunting two days a year and, and they only get to go on, you know, Thanksgiving break or I understand that's unimaginably hard to fathom. But if you've got four days to hunt and you're unprepared, those four days are going to be miserable. They're going to be hard. They're going to be tiring. But if you'll spend the first day not hunting and scouting and preparing yourself, it'll make the last three a whole lot more beneficial, a whole lot more successful, and a whole lot more enjoyable. So be okay. Inside of your preparation, be okay with burning a hunting day. Yep. Now, um, Aaron, has the – I think it was probably – four or five, four episodes ago, five episodes ago, uh, we talked about the adapt. Has that video dropped where you guys cover all the details about the adapt? Yep. All right. I'll put the link. Uh, if you guys want to check out the video that, that the hunting, that the hunting public did on the adapt, I'll put the link into the episode. Uh, that way you guys can check that out. Um, I haven't had the pleasure of shooting it, but I can't wait. Um, Chris, where all can they find season report at? seasonreport.com and on facebook and instagram at my season report now for a tool that i use all year long i've spent 10 bucks on a lot of things um but season report is one that is well well worth it um so go to seasonreport.com code hunting 101 in all caps we'll make that entire platform just 10 bucks for the entire year um and again i use it in the tree stand i use it the week leading up the day before uh months before I use it all of the time, so go check it out. Um, before we go, I do got to give a thank you to my friends over at NZ Campers. Um, NZ Campers are, in my opinion, they're just phenomenal. They are campers built for hunters by hunters. They have some incredible hunting features built into them, like meat storage and scent-free cabinets, which we've already talked about. Scent doesn't matter, but uh, I'm just kidding. Um, they have some incredible <laughs> features like boot dryers. Um, you can see them here. They've got different, um, they've got different models for for different kind of hunts. But they've got kitchens, um, they've got boot dryers, they've got, they're a toy hauler, so you can carry, you know, your four wheeler, your your golf cart, your side by side, whatever, out to the woods with you. And then you've got an incredible camper to sleep in once you get there. I would highly recommend you if you're ever in the um, need for a camper, I would highly recommend you to check out NZ Campers. He's a good friend of mine. They're phenomenally built. Go check them out. Guys, thank you for listening. Thank you for tuning in. 
Good luck this this season. Good luck in the woods. As always, I want to share in your success, so make sure and send over those success photos so I can celebrate in those with you. Thanks for listening. You guys have a great week.